welcome back in the previous lecture we had seen taylor series and zeros of holomorphic function so in continuation to that in this lecture we are going to see the laurent series and the singularities that is singularities of holomorphic function singularities of uh, functions and then you will also see the Fourier series as an application of Laurent series. So, in the previous lecture, we had already shown the Taylor series expansion for a holomorphic function in its domain of convergence, right? In a neighborhood of Z0, if you're writing a power series around Z0. A similar proof also was but now we have a weaker hypothesis that when f is holomorphic in open set omega except at a point z naught then f admits a infinite series expansion about z naught and here you see unlike before you also have the negative powers of z minus z naught in this expansion this is called the Laurent series and this is uh, valid in a neighborhood in the Andorra region. That is you have Z0 where the function is not holomorphic. You remove a ball of radius R and you have an Andorra region and you have F holomorphic in that Andorra region and F admits this Laurent series in a neighborhood in a region of in a region in the annular region and I mean so in some neighborhood of the annular region where this coefficient ak like before is nothing but the kth derivative of this 1 over w minus z0 this is valid for any gamma which is a simple loop contained in the annular region. Okay, so we have already seen the proof in the Taylor series. I'm just going to pick, so I'm, we are just going to pick the proof and we are going to continue the proof from there, but with a slight modification because now we have uh, now we don't have holomorphicity at a point z0 so to compensate that we need to do a slight variation so the idea is this once you have the domain omega so i'm not giving you the full picture here so what i'm saying so there is some domain omega here imagine okay and there is a point z0 in omega where the function is not holomorphic you take a ball of radius r about z0 which is inside here somewhere here okay somewhere here there is a ball of radius r i have not drawn all these pictures now you have the annular region and in the annular region you take this closed curve okay so here i have shown it like this basically these two are on the same line okay so they are on the same line so this is the same line so so this is oriented like this so there is a curve gamma you go like this you come up to the point where you started and then you go in and then you go down and then you come like this and then you go back here so this line you we use both the directions so this closed curve if we integrate along this closed curve, this opposite directions will cancel out each other and what you will have is the integral over this curve gamma and the minus of the integral over the curve C because the C is oriented like in the clockwise direction the way we have described here. So what is the proof? So you take a W on this curve gamma here. 
and z is any point in the interior of the closed curve that you have chosen okay that is this curve and z naught is here we have already noticed that so if i take a w on the gamma here then the distance of w from z naught is greater than the distance of w from z similarly if i take a w on this interior curve c then the distance of w from z naught is uh, is smaller than the distance of z from z naught right this distance is greater than the distance from this to this this is the property we have used so if you remember the taylor series proof we had used this property we had used this distance from the boundary right to write down the geometric series so we will do we are going to do something similar here so these two cases give you two different kinds of series so let's see the proof so from the Cauchy integral theorem f of z because gamma minus c gamma minus c that you which we just prescribed here that is this curve here is a curve in the annular region such that its interior is completely contained in the annular region right so it's a curve like that it's a closed curve the interior is completely contained in the annular region so this Cauchy integral formula is valid now in this case so you can write this as integral over gamma minus integral of the same thing over c now what happens at integral over gamma so when w belongs to gamma we just verified i just showed you that for when w belongs to w minus z naught is bigger than z minus z naught right w minus z naught is bigger than z minus z naught sorry earlier i compared like this so w minus z naught is bigger than z minus z naught okay so we use this fact and this is precisely the Taylor series equation so the integral over gamma if you use whatever we did for Taylor series that is w, you add and subtract z naught here and take out the common z minus z naught and so on whatever we did for Taylor series we are going to have a series here for this integral will turn out to be some series with the coefficients as stated in the as, as given in the statement of the theorem now the what remains is the integral over c which is with a minus sign so minus integral over c so when w belongs to c i've already said when w belongs to c w minus z naught is smaller than z minus z naught so w minus z naught is smaller than z minus so the inequality reverses when w belongs to c here so you use the same technique as you did for Taylor series but now you so you start with minus of integral c this but minus you bring it here so this becomes z minus w so in z minus w you add and subtract z naught and you take z minus z naught common so this is something which you can rewrite um, so rewrite the denominator here like this and in this case now this w minus z naught is smaller than z minus z naught you can use the geometric series so you get here the geometric series here right with f this and now here again you you have an integral which is over uh, w so whatever is for example, this can be rewritten as like this, where I just brought this, uh, I have just reintroduced, you see, starting from m equal to 0 to infinity. I have just changed the index to start it from, uh, from 1. So here you see there is z minus z naught power m, that is z minus z naught, so that is z minus z naught m plus 
n plus 1 here in the denominator which when goes to the top becomes minus m plus 1 and that's precisely what you have here. And this my w minus z naught power n, if you rewrite, it becomes this. So this whatever we have here is precisely this. Okay, we return just so, so that the indices start from the index starts from one. Okay, it's the same after we are ending. So this is precisely the series. So the first part gives you the Taylor series kind of thing. This is if you notice, it's nothing but the negative powers of z minus z naught right so this uh, integral over c gives you this so if you sum them you actually have the lot of series okay now if you bring this now you have this other thing which is uh, the residue theorem or the residue result you can introduce you can introduce a concept of residue of a function at any point z naught so if f is a holomorphic function except at z naught so you see in the previous lecture we have talked about functions which are holomorphic in the given domain and in this lecture we are looking at functions when it fails to be holomorphic at a particular point one or more than one point so we are studying its properties so the previous thing was something like a power series expansion for a function about a point where, where it fails to be holomorphic. Now when you have a function which is holomorphic except at a point z0 then you can define what is called the residue of f at z0 is nothing but this integral for any curve gamma, uh, any closed curve gamma such that z0 is in the interior of gamma. This is what is called the residue of f at z naught. So if you look this, if you look at uh, the Laurent series of f, this is precisely residue of f is nothing but the coefficient a minus one. That is the coefficient corresponding to one over z minus z naught. Okay. So that you can see uh, if you look at the thing here, if you integrate over this, you see here that everything else over the closed loop uh, will vanish and what remains is the coefficient of a minus 1, I mean sorry, the coefficient of z minus uh, 1, 1 over z minus z naught. So with this, we can now state what is called the residue theorem. So earlier we had seen that when the function was holomorphic, uh, this quantity integral over f, this is actually zero. That's what we have seen for a simple loop, right? Which is the Cauchy's theorem. In a sense, this is a generalization of Cauchy's theorem when the function f fails to be holomorphic at finite number of points. I have not yet said what are poles here, but these are points where they fail to be holomorphic, let's say. Okay. They fail to be holomorphic, or uh, I mean, pole is where the function blows up. Okay. Okay. So, uh, this is the kind of generalization of the Cauchy theorem where the function is now not holomorphic everywhere but holomorphic except at some finite number of points and these points are precisely let's say where they blow up right so then this integral is precisely the sum of the residue of f at zk z1 z2 zk are the poles now this is again uh, uh, i'm just going to sketch the proof of this using the diagram so the idea is uh, this that given the in the domain what you do is that 
suppose say I'm just giving you one situation here what you can do suppose this point is the point this point is z1 the pole right and the point is z1 then you take a ball around you, can, you take a ball around that and you take any closed so this statement is about over gamma is a simple loop right for in the counterclockwise so take so this let's say this is the gamma then you take a small ball of some radius positive radius around the pole right around the blow up point and then you join by this line so you actually consider this closed curve where you start oriented like this come like this go along this line right come like this and go along this line and you which means you have come to the same point where you started now this is a um, this is again a closed curve and you know that uh, the integral of Integral of this uh, can be integral of this is actually zero. So in this case, the integral over this closed curve is precisely integral over this curve minus integral over this curve. Right? So that's what you get. So what you get is if you start with this integral over this minus, so that minus goes here. Uh, so it becomes plus integral over the smaller ball, this ball. And this by definition is precisely this by definition is precisely the residue at the point z1 so if you have more than one pole so you for each pole you do the same thing you take a smaller ball you join by a line take that close take that curve coming down here coming down here going like this and so on so if you suppose you have another point here let's say then you join like this start from this point Come here, come here, come here, come here, go here, then come down along that line, go here like this, and then go. So you can do this for any finite number of poles inside the domain. So you get a curve and you will get that many. So the entire integral reduces to sum over integrals of all these smaller balls over the finite number of poles, and those precisely are the residue of Fz. So you can prove it like that. So so this is the residue theorem which tells you that uh, when you can you, I mean you know the value of this integral which was zero when f was all holomorphic when f is not holomorphic at some point and it blows up at those points then the value is nothing but the residue of this so if you know the Laurent series of this at every about every point z k then they are precisely the coefficients a minus one corresponding to the Laurent series about z k okay now using this Laurent series let's uh, retrieve the Fourier series uh, for periodic functions okay if you have already seen it you must know that Every periodic function uh, can be written down. There are uh, you can you so you have a Fourier series expansion for that. So let's define what is the notion of periodicity. Uh, in the complex plane, there are uh, different kinds of periods. So there is a we we have used this, uh, adjective simply periodic because there is also a notion of doubly periodic and so on. Because now you can have periodicity in uh, uh, different directions right so so let's not get into that so this is a generalization of the usual periodicity that you see in one dimension in one side so what is a periodic uh, function or simply periodic function or is that if there is a non-zero complex number omega such that fz plus omega is fz for all z and c and w is called a period of f So here you usually choose the minimum minimum such omega for which this happens, right? If there, so that's called the period. So this is a so this is a fun periodic function of period omega. 
So now for this definition to, to make sense, it uh, one should ensure that uh, for this definition to be well defined makes sense that since f is defined on omega when you talk of z plus omega it should also belong to omega only then this will make sense right so in fact once you have z plus k omega then z plus k omega is z plus uh, k minus 1 omega plus omega which is z plus k minus 1 omega which again by iterative process you can show that f of z plus k omega is actually f of z so you have that kind of uh, i mean integral in, uh, integer multiple integral multiple of the uh, period also is a, is, is also a period right? that is why you choose a minimum here so for this definition to make sense you ensure that when you translate z it still remains in the domain so your domain is chosen in such a way that it has this property that for all k z plus k omega is in omega so this is a little omega capital omega so z plus k little omega belongs to capital omega so domain should have should satisfy that condition for well defined purpose for well uh, yeah, for well for well definedness now uh, as an example you see that e power i z is a 2 pi periodic function right right how do you see that wherever you have z you put z plus 2 pi when you put z plus 2 pi here you have e i z into e i 2 pi right e i 2 pi is uh, precisely 1 so it becomes e i z so this is a 2 pi periodic function and what is the domain of this function the domain of this function is actually the infinite the horizontal strip with uh, the imaginary part lying between minus pi and plus pi okay so the domain of this function is this and its image is this annular region so this is an annular region it's a circle of uh, uh, so radius e power minus pi so this is a region lying between a circle of radius e power minus pi and radius e power pi okay so that's the image of uh, image of this function so if you just so here you see you have taken the infinite strip so when you do a play, z plus 2 pi it is still in the domain so it makes perfect sense so e i z is actually a 2 pi periodic function whose domain is the infinite infinite horizontal strip bounded between minus pi and pi and its image is this annular region bounded between circle of radius e power minus pi and e power pi and in this region so because it's uh, well defined there is no it's like single valued function it's not a multi-valued you actually have the inverse of uh, this function also which is given by log w so inverse is now a map from this annular region to this infinite horizontal strip and that is given by log of w so you take any w from in this annular region log of w will give you an element in this infinite horizontal strip so this is an example of a 2 pi periodic function So more generally you can you could have an integer multiple here in this function so e i k z which is actually by the Euler's formula is a linear combination of complex linear combination of sine k z cos k z these are all 2 pi periodic functions these are all examples of 2 pi periodic functions right now we are going to give a nice uh, classification or description of this 2 pi periodic uh, 2 pi periodic holomorphic function so if you take a 2 pi periodic holomorphic function then it is uh, in one to one correspondence with all holomorphic functions on the annular region this annular region okay so there is an one to one correspondence between uh, between 2 pi periodic functions and functions defined on this annular region so sorry there is probably a this is this should be e power minus pi okay that's a typo here it's e power minus pi so there is a one-to-one -one correspondence how do you see this correspondence a, a quick proof is this suppose you are given a two pi periodic holomorphic function okay 
in C, right? Two by periodic holomorphic function. Then you define G, which is that you compose F with log W. So you see log W is uh, has the domain annular region. So W comes from this annular region. Log W will take it to the infinite strip and F of that. Okay, that is how you define G. So now G is a function on this annular defined on this annular region, and this is just composition of uh, holomorphic functions. They are holomorphic. So given F, you have defined a holomorphic function on the annular region. Conversely, suppose you are given a holomorphic function on the annular region, you define F to be uh, G composed with e, e i z right G of e i z this is you see is a function from the infinite strip right um, yeah uh, it's function from the infinite strip the annular region and G is from the annular region so this is a well defined function so you have so for every 2 pi periodic function you can associate a holomorphic function on the annular region on this annular region okay from e power minus pi to e power pi annular region so there's this nice correspondence right between two pi periodic function and holomorphic function on the annular region so what is Fourier series theorem tells you that if you have a two pi periodic um, uh, function um, two pi periodic holomorphic function in the strip okay which is uh, I think I made a mistake. There should be a parenthesis, closing parenthesis here, which is in which is defined in the uh, infinite horizontal strip. Then F admits a Fourier series representation. That means F has this form. That is F is infinite linear combination of the periodic function e i k z. That is the example that I gave for periodic function. So every two pi periodic function is actually in some sense a uh, can be written as a sum infinite sum of uh, simple exam simple periodic function that we wrote you that we gave for the classical periodic function sine and cos where these coefficients are given by this formula so how do you prove this so you start with this fact that so because f is a 2 pi periodic function on the strip you can associate to it a holomorphic function in the annular region that is by composing it with the log function. So you define G as F composed with log. This is holomorphic in the annular region, right? Composition of holomorphic functions. So since G is defined in the annular region, it will admit a Laurent series. That's what we have already seen in the beginning of this lecture. So G will admit a Laurent series of this form centered at about the origin right because that annular region the annular region was a uh, annular region was something that was centered at origin right this annular region is centered at origin so the this Laurent series you have is so it's about origin so this g admits a Laurent series about origin because it is on an annular region centered at the origin and the coefficient of a k by that Laurent series expansion we know is given by this where this inter where this curve gamma taken is the unit circle and you see unit circle is actually lying in this annular region unit circle is a uh, unit circle is a loop in this annular region okay so so you have a k given by this coefficient. Now you use this fact that that f of z is related to g like this, right? That's what we show that common combination. So if g is a holomorphic function in the annular region, then the function f is given like this. So f of z is g of e i z, but g of w is this. So wherever you have w, you replace by e i z. In this series, you get a k e power i k z. So w power k is e i z power k is e i k z. Right. So this is precisely the Fourier series that we are looking for. So f of z has this form, and this 
formula that you are saying for AK will will obtain you will obtain by putting AK in this formula wherever you have W you put EIZ but W is coming from the unit circle which means that uh, Z uh, so this W this EIZ should be in the unit circle which means E is EI theta integral is over 0 to 2 pi right so use this information so you just substitute for this W here with EI Z where Z is my theta right so you get this extent expression which you should simplify is precisely with so this is precisely if you know if you have seen Fourier series before so this is precisely the Fourier series the inner product of um, f with e, e power minus i k theta basically the l2 uh, l2 inner product Okay, so this is now we have obtained Fourier series as an application of Laurent series. Okay, I wanted to make this connection. Now, now earlier we saw Taylor series and we talked about zeros of holomorphic function. Now we talk about singularities, where as you see, Laurent series is written for functions where it uh, where it fails to be holomorphic. So. Um, Let's look at cases of uh, situations where a function can fail to be holomorphic and what can we talk about, what can we say about these points. So we say a point Z0 is a singularity of F if F is not holomorphic at Z0. But every neighborhood of Z0 has at least one point where F is holomorphic. What we mean here is something like say we already talked about something like conjugate function is not holomorphic it's not holomorphic anywhere except zero right now so any non-zero point cannot be said uh, cannot be uh, called a singularity of uh, z bar okay so point is that if you what what do you call singularity is that the function is not holomorphic at that point but there is a neighborhood around z0 in which there is at least one point where f is holomorphic okay so singularity means that there is a neighborhood and in that so in every neighborhood there is a point where it is holomorphic so it cannot uh, be not holomorphic in the entire neighborhood of that point like what like it happens for z bar or real part of z all these are not holomorphic functions so this is uh, so singularity means that that it is it fails to be holomorphic at a point but in every neighborhood there is a point where it is holomorphic so and we say a singularity is isolated if the function is holomorphic in a neighborhood of z0 so it's isolated if there is a neighborhood where the where in where in that neighborhood removed uh, z0 excluding z0 in every other point the function is holomorphic so then you call the singularities isolated okay. and a removable singularity is a singular point uh, it's, it's a singular point where except that point in the neighborhood of z0 the function is bounded okay so there is there is a notion of singularity of a holomorphic function and there is a notion of so a singularity could be isolated and non isolated okay and isolated singularity can be divided into different types uh, we are going to see it so one is this that uh, an isolated singularity could be removable singularity an isolated singularity could be a pole and an isolated singularity could be an essential singularity and pole and essential singularity is something we will see uh, very soon okay so let's look at some examples so i mean just to understand this as i said see z bar real part of z these are all not these are not holomorphic in c i mean except at zero all. and hence has no singularities means that you cannot say that 
non-zero complex numbers are singular singular points of this because in a, in every neighborhood it is not holomorphic so such things are ruled out now a function like this 1 over sine 1 over z has non isolated singularity at 0 right why we have, we have actually notice now sine 1 over z so sine is 0 sine is 0 at k pi so whenever 1 over z is k pi this denominator is 0 so which means z is 1 over k pi so whenever z is 1 over k pi this is 0 so this blows up right and the limit of this is actually 0 and it's and that 0 point is also a singularity but it's not isolated because in every neighborhood you have one isolated singularity sorry for this typo here okay so this is a non-isolated singularity so zero is a non-isolated singularity of this function similarly whenever you have this branch point when these are these are singularity which are not isolated because whenever you have a branch point you need to take a branch cut starting from the branch point and only then you can define a single value function outside that so a branch point is always a non-isolated uh, again a typo here okay um, so a branch point is always a non-isolated singularity for instance for log z zero which is a branch point is a non-isolated singularity and a function like this sin z over z has a singularity at zero but that singularity is a removable singularity right reason is because this function is bounded in a neighborhood of zero right as z goes to zero this function goes this limit goes to one this is something which we know right so, uh, from analysis so the function is bounded so it has a single because it is undefined form right sine 0 over 0 by 0 form it's an undefined form so but you can make this uh, you can make so removable singularity in the sense you can make it holomorphic by defining it at the point 0 and the way you define it, you you put the value 1 at at z equal to 0 then by 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 doing that you have removed the singularity so the undefined form has been replaced by some definition this you can all do whenever whenever it's a removable uh, whenever it's a removable singularity that is the function is bounded in the neighborhood of the singularity okay so this is a, a theorem of uh, riemann which which is about the removable singularity so what does this theorem say is that if f is holomorphic and bounded in omega minus z naught that means it's holomorphic everywhere in z naught except at z naught and it's bounded in this domain then you can then you have a extension to this holomorphic function so you actually have a holomorphic extension to f which let's call it f tilde which means except at z0 you keep the function as itself so at z0 is where you have trouble because it's not holomorphic there but you can give a value at z0 and then it becomes holomorphic in there so you have in holomorphic so whenever you have a removable singularity you can extend the holomorphic function uh, as a you, you can you can extend the function holomorphically uh, so holomorphically even to the singularity Right, because the removal singularity you can you can define it you can just say love because it's a bounded in, uh, in that region limit of w going to z naught you look at this limit and that way you can extend it holomorphically or uh, alternately you can actually so the result actually says that whenever you have a removal singularity then z minus z naught fz this limit is always zero this is something I'm not going to prove here, but it's easy to prove. You can always check this. Whenever f is has removable singularity, you can see that f is bounded. So this limit is always going to be zero because z minus z naught will go to zero as z goes to z naught. Conversely, uh, whenever uh, this happens, 
then you can verify that it has to be removed with singularity if at all because f i've already said f is holomorphic and uh, and holomorphic in omega minus z naught okay so whenever uh, this limit happens you can verify that this is you can you just have to show that f has to be bounded in a neighborhood which will happen because of this limit going to zero because z minus z naught will go to zero as z goes to z naught so if this product has to go to zero and this goes to zero then this cannot really uh, blow up much okay so i leave the proof to you but i this is easy to prove it's not a bit difficult so basically the riemann removal singularity theorem tells you that if you have a removable singularity then you can holomorphically extend it to include uh, to a function which doesn't have any singularity at the at the point now what is a pole and what are essential singularities so i said whenever you have a non isolated singularity you have a removable singularity which we have already seen and what is a pole a pole is a point at which the function blows up that is it is unbounded in the neighborhood of z not unlike the removable singularity situation okay and you say a pole is of order k like the way we have seen a zero of order k a pole is uh, of order k if limit of z going to so z not is the pole means that if you approach the pole z minus z not with there is some uh, so it, it's of order k if z minus z not power k product that function f right where f is the function which is holomorphic except say at z not and it blows up uh, at z not then if you multiply this then it go then it is finite and non zero okay if it's finite and non zero uh, for this for for some k then then it's a pole of order k if the k is 1 then you call then you say it's a simple pole if no such k exists then z not is an essential singularity of it that is it's a so essential singularity is precisely a pole of infinite order that means you you cannot find a finite k such that this limit is uh, finite okay let's look at um, some property of poles so if f has a pole of order k uh, if and only if uh, limit of z going to z not z minus z not k plus 1 so here it's k by definition k plus 1 will always be 0 that's natural because you can this easy to prove we are not i'm not going to prove it here both both ways both necessary and sufficiency can be proved just from the definition here okay order k pole gives you this which means this has to go to zero right so now uh, let's look at some examples so the function e1 over z e power 1 over z has an essential singularity of 0 because at z equal to 0 this is e power infinity this blows up at z equal to 0 so at z equal to 0 this has essential singularity that means you you do not have a k such that uh, i mean you actually have you i mean you do not have a k such that this happens right this goes to finite in fact if you write down the uh, power series expansion of this then you will see that uh, then you will see that you will have uh, 1 over z uh, powers of 1 over z uh, for all case like the infinite powers of 1 over z so you actually so z equal to 0 is actually a pole of infinite order so essential singularity another example that uh, i want to show is this uh, this function which is some function cooked up function to just for you to see all the situations in one example so this function has a simple pole at plus or minus i so you see z square so this function will have a pole when this denominator vanishes denominator can vanish when z square plus 1 is 0 which is precisely whenever z is plus or minus i that is one possible so it's simple pole at plus or minus i and here again there is a uh, singularity because this is the cube root of z plus h so when z is 
minus 2 this is 0 so this is a cube root of this so there is a branch point at minus 2 and this branch point at minus 2 is also a singularity right and then you have this is precisely like e power 1 over z right this looks like that so when z is equal to 1 this is infinity so this is again a kind of essential singularity this is an essential so z equal to 1 is an essential singularity for this so this function has a pole a pole singularity, a branch point singularity, and an essential singularity. Okay, so these things can happen for a function. Now, a property of essential singularity, so it's a nice property which tells you that uh, whenever you have an essential singularity, then the function takes uh, almost all the complex values in a neighborhood of that singularity. Okay, that means it just because see, it's singularity means it's blow, blow, uh, kind of blowing up at that point, but uh, around that point, uh, any neighborhood that you take, uh, it can take uh, values as large or any any given complex number, it can take in in a neighborhood. It it it, it kind of blows up like that. Okay, in fact. Uh, a much uh, stronger version of this so uh, this theorem that we have that we are going to prove now is what is called the picard's grade theorem which actually tells you that it can take any complex number any number of tangents even infinite numbers except one point it can take every other complex number infinite number of times this is picard's grade theorem this is a very um, uh, toned down simpler version of that which actually tells you that if f has an essential singularity at z naught and is holomorphic in the neighborhood of z naught that is it's not holomorphic at z naught but it's holomorphic in the neighborhood of z naught then the image of this uh, punctured neighborhood is dense in c and that's what it means that it can take almost all the complex values so this f can take almost all the complex values in this neighborhood itself okay so what is the proof of this uh, suppose f of u is not dense in c that means the closure of f of u is a proper subset of uh, c right so which means you can choose a w uh, in the complement of uh, so if this is a mistake i should say uh, f of u bar okay that's again a mistake it's not c minus u it's c minus uh, f of u bar okay so it's so c minus f of u bar then choose a point so whenever this uh, this closure is like f of u is not dense in c then you can pick a point like this what this equivalently means is that for uh, there is an epsilon such that mod f of z minus w is greater than or equal to epsilon for all z in u right see when you say dense dense means what that suppose f of u is dense in c then if i pick any w in c and if i take any epsilon neighborhood then that should contain points from f of u right so which means that this right? yeah, when we say that uh, when we are assuming that it is not dense and what we are actually saying is that there is an epsilon such that uh, if you choose if you choose a w in the complement of f of u bar then there is a epsilon and a ball that you can epsilon ball that you can find around the w such that uh, all the fz all the all elements of f of u are lying outside that ball that's what this means right density means that i mean not being dense means that right so now using this you define g to be 1 over fz minus w for this choice of w okay so from here what you see that um, whenever uh, f has a zero that is whenever f vanishes gz is still well defined right whereas whenever f has a 
pole that is f blows up whenever f blows up it so any pole or any uh, singularity of f is actually a zero of g okay that's the property that you see the way we have defined and this g is holomorphic the way we have defined it's uh, holomorphic except at z naught right by definition itself so the f is holomorphic except at z naught so g is also holomorphic except at z naught but the beauty here is that uh, g has a singularity at uh, g has a removable singularity at z naught Right, which means that in the neighborhood of Z naught, G should be bounded, which is true because mod f of Z minus W for all Z in U is bigger than or equal epsilon. So one over of this, so mod of G is mod of this. This is less than one over epsilon. So G is actually bounded in U. So in the neighborhood of Z naught, G is U, which means that G is holomorphic in U. And it's bounded in U, which means G has a removable singularity at Z naught. So you just ex you have a holomorphic extension of G to to U union uh, Z naught. Okay, you can you can extend it holomorphically right, because of the removable singularity. Now, so G is now a holomorphic function in this entire U union Z naught neighborhood. This means what? This means that this function f, which from here I just one can rewrite f in terms of g, right? So f from this formula we see that f of z is w plus one over g z, which means that this f has either a pole because whenever g of z not we have extended g, right? So g of z if g of z not is zero. Then f of z not is infinity. F of z not is infinity, which means it has a pole, right? If the g of z not is not zero, then uh, f has a removable singularity. G of z not is not zero, then you have a removable singularity. By, <coughs> by the way, because g itself has a removable singularity. So this contradicts the fact that we started with. Right, we started because this f is given because z naught is an essential singularity of f, whereas uh, we have we are getting that z naught is either a pole or a removable singularity. That is a contradiction. So our assumption that this is dense, this is not dense, is wrong. So this f of u is actually dense in C. Okay, so this is a property of uh, essential singularity. So, if you have an essential singularity at a point, and then in uh, in in a in a neighborhood of the essential singularity, the function will take almost all the complex numbers. Okay. Now, some uh, connections. So, if you recall that whenever whenever you I mean the, this real function, the one over one plus x square. This function was defined everywhere in R, and this function is differentiable in all of R. But we have seen in real analysis that uh, this function and, and the power series of this function converges to this only when you have one, one, one so only in this interval minus one to one. Okay, and that, that's what we said is the radius of convergence of this power series and so on and so forth. So in fact, complex and so this complex singularities gives an answer to why these things happen in the sense that this was a function which is which is well defined everywhere in R and so on, but somehow the power series convergence happened only in a restricted domain, not in the entire R. The reason is because this this function had a has had a complex singularity, so the uh, holomorphic extension of this. Uh, one plus x square would be one plus z square minus one, and this has uh, singularity at uh, plus or minus one. So when you when you are looking at this function as a real variable function, you did not notice any singularity, but still the power series was converging only in a restricted path because its uh, so singularity was exactly a distance of one away. 
Okay, so when you so that is simply f plus or minus one, which means the disk of convergence should be uh, less than uh, this plus or minus one. So which is why you had exactly the radius of convergence or disk of convergence to be one. So the usual idea is that uh, what that usually the radius of convergence of the power series to the function is usually the distance uh, from the nearest singularity from the point that you are taking to the nearest singularity ok so in this case in the nearest singularity is plus or minus i which is the distance uh, which is a distance 1 from the origin so the radius of convergence was 1 in this case ok so with this we have completed uh, singularities and by this we have seen Taylor series, Laurent series, zeros of function, poles, singularities, essential singularities, isolated singular, I mean isolated singularity, non-isolated singularity, isolated singularity can be seen in terms of removal singularity, poles and essential singularity. So please brush up these things if, uh, with more examples and exercises from the from the reference books and textbooks. Okay, see you in the next lecture.